Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we're here uh, on the traditional unceded lands of the Musqueam people. And um, it's our pleasure, as, you, as, as always, to be, uh, to be here with you today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Spencer Lilly, who is here um, coming close to the end of his visit with us at the iSchool. He's here as the Dodson Visiting Scholar. And it has been a very great pleasure to have him here with us. He is an uh, honest, genuine, um, helpful, engaged scholar. Uh, he's brought a lot to our school, both to our students, to our faculty. Uh, and it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to have diverse perspectives brought into the school. Uh, it's always fun to have international visitors and learn a little bit about um, how education takes place. Uh, in other parts of the world. So um, I want to thank you, Spencer, for what has been so far a, a wonderful visit and a very, very valuable for all of us. Um, and now to the topic of our talk today. Uh, this is a talk that was initiated uh, jointly, I believe, in some, uh, some form um, through the diversity and inclusion team at the UBC Library and the iSchool. And um, Spencer has graciously agreed to give a second talk during his visit, so we're really pleased. Um, and I'm, um, I'm convinced that this is an important topic. It's a timely um, topic for discussion, something that concerns all of us at the iSchool, within the UBC Library, and of course uh, within Canada more broadly. And so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to Spencer's talk and to the discussion that follows. So, welcome. Tēnā uh, koutou Thank you, Lorraine, for that um, very gracious um, introduction. Uh, and I'd like to also thank um, the Musqueam people for their um, hospitality while I've been here in Vancouver. Um, that I've had an opportunity to engage with the local community, um, and they have been um, wonderful hosts. And uh, we hope that we can return the favour at some stage um, if they should come to New Zealand. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, Sarah DuPont and Lisa Nathan for their assistance in putting this together today, and also Kim Lawson, who is, um, has agreed to sort of try and give my uh, discussion today some coherence at the end. Um, if I speak too much like a New Zealander, hopefully she can put it in a Canadian context. If, if she feels that there's something that I've said that um, you know, sort of needs to be explained a little bit more in the Canadian context as well, that hopefully that will um, assist as well. Um, the, the topic, as Luanne says, is, is a very important one uh, in the uh, library and information professions both here and in New Zealand. And I hope I can draw upon some of my experiences in New Zealand um, while I have this um, presentation this afternoon. And you may be able to put it into the Canadian context yourself, because um, there are very many similarities between New Zealand and Canada. Um, and it's no accident that we were both um, sort of colonised by people from England, um, you had the added um, sort of uh, colonisation by French as well, but um, if you look at uh, many of our systems, they are very much the same, and a lot of Commonwealth, um, the British Commonwealth um, precedents um, apply here as they do in New Zealand. Um, this uh, opening slide um, is by a New Zealand artist by the name of Dick Frizzell. He is um, Pākehā, in, in other words, he's not Māori, um, and he has taken this image um, to sort of indicate the process of um, indigenisation that can take place within um, a familiar image. Um, you'll notice that the image on the left is Semi resembles Mickey Mouse. I think he couldn't really copy Mickey Mouse properly without getting into trouble with Disney. Um, but everyone gets the, the idea that it's Mickey Mouse, and he 
takes it through a period of transition um, to where it becomes too Miki, um, which really in um, Māori um, terms means awesome. You know, so um, so if someone's if something's too Miki, that it basically means it's really um, great. Um, so. Uh, I may have appropriated his image this afternoon, but he has not only appropriated a bit of Disney's image, he's also appropriated a bit of um, Māori imagery, imagery as well. So um, there's a lot of appropriation going on, um, and so I think I can be excused. Okay, um, coming to the um, topic of this afternoon, um, really needing to get to the bottom of decolonisation. Linda Tuiwai Smith uh, wrote uh, a seminal work in 1999 um, called Decolonising Methodologies. It um, had its second edition published in 2012. Um, although there are a lot of other works on decolonisation before Linda published her book, um, there is uh, little doubt that hers is the seminal text on the relationship between indigenous peoples and um, research and Western researchers. Um, her work has empowered indigenous communities to take control of, their re of the research agenda and demand not only greater transparency but higher degrees of accountability from the academy, the government, funding agencies and the professions that are engaging with the indigenous communities. Um, and this is really the definition that she has um, um, identified as being um, at the crux of decolonisation. So it's sort of really taking back a lot of that power. As I said, she's not the only one that's written on decolonisation. And you can see that there's a lot of decolonisation um, literature um, going um, through a number of authors, um, and we can see it in education, museums, social work, um, decolonising the intellectuals, <laughs> um, solidarity, feminism, trauma work, and employment. Uh, so it's been given a lot of um, focus in a number of different professions and how, it's, um, how they engage with indigenous peoples. Um, it, the decolonisation process um, really looks at um, how he hegemonic um, systems um, and the epistemological violence associated with that hegemony can be um, dissected and returned to its indigenous um, state. Uh, Decolonisation really uh, restores that indigenous worldview as, as the basis and organisation for knowledge transformation um, and transmission. Um, in New Zealand, Graham Smith, who just happens to be Linda Tuiwai's um, husband, but they are both um, esteemed scholars in their own right, and I, I know that um, Graham has been here at UBC before. Um, Graham put um, the whole decolonisation uh, into perspective by um, outlining Kopapa Māori, which um, he identified as six core principles that looked at items such as self-determination, cultural aspiration, um, socio-economic mediation, in other words, um, looking at research that benefits indigenous peoples, not research that exploits indigenous peoples, looking at how um, indigeneity is expressed through um, family structures um, and the socio-structures of um, indigenous society and how knowledge is founded through collective philosophy. Um, he puts it much more eloquently, um, I've, I've sort of used the translations, but 
Kaupapa Māori was originally written with Māori um, terms to describe some of those English terms, and, and, and they don't always quite make the transition from um, Māori into English. But effectively, decolonising is, is about empowering, and um, that is what Kaupapa Māori has done in New Zealand. So um, just to summarise that, it's the process of discovering indigeneity um, or rediscovering indigeneity. This has somewhat been hidden over um, the centuries since colonisation has taken place um, through the tools of change that were brought in by the colonisers, effectively education and religion. And this is trying to get to the heart of how knowledge is created when you are looking at um, things through an indigenous lens um, to try and identify how everything connects to um, each other. Um, so it's um, through that reconstruction you can revise and review what we already know in the colonial context and dissect it and bring it back into um, an indigenous context um, and to give status back what we call mana which is all about prestige and status and making um, things um, more um, important um, or recognising their importance. Okay, so decolonising, we've looked at that. Indigenisation. And, you know, I've, I've had a lot of trouble um, over the last 14 weeks trying to work out whether um, Canada is a Z country or an S country. Um, to me, the natural way of decolonising and indigenising is to use an S rather than the Z. So I don't know whether I've been colonised while I've been here by, 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 by your version of the Canadian language, but um, if I have inadvertently put any S's in, um, it's not because I'm being inconsistent, I'm just reverting to tr true type. <laughs> um, although there are some distinct similarities between decolonisation and indigenisation, there are also distinct differences in how they are applied. Critical to this, is the, to this process is the influence that indigenous constructs have and, and how critical they come to being the core of the structures that you are applying either of these concepts to. Um, I didn't have a a definition of indigenisation from an um, indigenous author. Um, so I went back to that great old colonial dictionary, the Oxford et, uh, um, English Dictionary, that um, apparently tells us how we should be speaking English. Um, but they don't speak it the New Zealand way. Um, they don't have many New Zealand slang words in there, for instance. Okay, so. Like um, the decolonising um, literatures, there's a lot about indigenising. Um, the um, book, The Indigenising the Academy by Mahusia, I hope I say that right, and Wilson, um, really seemed to set a, a benchmark for um, how indigeneity structures, disciplines and professions interact within the university and um, I guess the ivory tower. There has been a lot of focus around um, other areas um, and you can see a theme here where we're either talking about a little bit about education and culture or we're talking a lot about how um, the sort of the mind needs to be indigenized. Um, when you look at the works by, on psychology and mental health services and counsellor education um, Sexuality, I guess, stands out on its, on its right uh, uh, itself, and it may have some connections to those previous three. 
When I was looking at the literature on both decolonising and indigenising, I noticed that there was a real gap, and that gap is in the professions um, relating to library and information management, so library archives and information management itself. This, um, I think, is um, a gap that needs to be filled. It's, it's time has come to be filled. It's, it's overdue. Um, basically, um, as public institutions, uh, they have the libraries and archives and information agencies have the potential to have a transformational effect on how indigenous, indigenous knowledge is organised, managed and disseminated. They also have an important role in empowering indigenous communities and to help non-indigenous peoples learn and understand more about indigenous history, culture, values and the contribution that indigenous people make to wider society. So in the process of indigenising, we have to recognise that indigenous knowledge and perspectives have that validity in the academy and in the institutions that we are associated with. There needs to be a, a greater emphasis on identifying the ways in which this indigeneity can be expressed and how it is represented in the curriculum uh, that are uh, um, taught in our uh, library and information management schools. That also requires um, an increased emphasis on creating opportunities for indigenous research, learning and teaching and ensuring that um, indigenous items are included in the different parts of the, uh, the curricula that are, are taught. Uh, this school here at UBC has got a First Nations concentration, curriculum concentration, and which is a fantastic um, program uh, to, to have as part of the, the iSchool. Um, however, the, it shouldn't be the only answer. There needs to be um, a, uh, or, an audit of other um, courses being taught and to see how, where else Indigenous information and knowledge can be inserted into the, the curriculum so that it's not only those taking the First Nations curriculum concentration that will be exposed to the um, Indigenous content. Uh, that requires really um, a discussion to be held um, and relationships to, to be um, engaged in between um, the school and uh, with the various communities that are, are present here locally um, and with members of the profession that have a stake in, in this particular issue. So getting that indigenous participation is um, something that needs to be followed through on. Um, inviting rather than summoning, um, but developing that engagement with that community will um, bring value to both the, the iSchool and to that community itself. So um, coming back to the decolonisation versus indigenisation thing, um, is decolonisation really possible? And um, I'll just run through this. I don't want to take up too much time, but we have to remember that both in New Zealand and Canada, because we were colonised from the Western world, um, the structures that were brought in were very similar in both countries. You know, we, the early libraries were private, um, that later became mechanical um, in institutes that made items available um, through libraries for people. Then we had Andrew Carnegie who seemed to dish money out left, right and centre all around the world for, for free public libraries. And um, libraries um, benefited from the endowments and bequests of early collectors of indigenous um, manuscripts. Um, and in New Zealand we have several examples and I know you have here too. 
the, um, the indigenous knowledge, on the other hand, is um, about the collective good. Um, it was uh, primarily transmitted through oral means. Um, it had a structure of protection um, in its um, way it was transmitted in terms of who was eligible to receive the knowledge that was um, able to be transmitted. And um, it represented the relationship between indigenous people and all living things. Um, so it was a holistic view. The question is, is decolonisation really possible when libraries, archives and other information agencies were really a colonial construct in the first place and were not, um, are not an indigenous concept in their own right? Um, so is it possible to decolonise a colonial construct? Um, it's a good question, uh, you know, and, and the um, answer I can give you at the moment is possibly. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to commit myself. Uh, um, indigenous uh, nations, both here and within New Zealand, are um, looking at developing their own cultural knowledge centres that give um, the power back to either the bands, um, the nations, the hapu or the iwi. Um, hapu or iwi, sub-tribe, tribe in New Zealand language. Um, and these, um, by developing these cultural institutions, they are um, essentially bringing the knowledge back together for their indigenous community. In doing so, they want to repatriate objects from libraries, archives and museums so that they have them in, under their protection and uh, control. And um, they, that they can integrate with other um, cultural objects that they already have and use their own knowledge organisation systems um, and not be bound by the um, proprietary ones of Dewey or the, the Library of Congress. So these um, college, uh, cultural knowledge centres would be by the people, for the people, with the people. Um, this is um, a weak attempt by me to uh, try and illustrate where I think um, I'm going for the next few minutes. Uh, it's looking at the, how institutions, organisations and, individ and individuals need to um, view indigenisation. Um, so, you know, this classic Venn diagram um, hopefully will you know, sort of make sense. So institutions, and when I'm talking about institutions, I'm really talking about the um, library and information management agencies, including libraries, archives, and other forms. Um, it's really about looking at um, indigenizing um, through the use of staff, and that's recruiting more indigenous uh, staff members and doing your utmost to keep them when you have recruited them. It's a common problem that we find in um, New Zealand is that we put a lot of effort into recruitment and we do not see the same amount of effort going into retention and we have a high turnover of people coming in and out of the profession. Um, it costs a lot to recruit someone. Um, it will cost you a lot more if you don't retain them. There's also a necessity to um, look at your non-Indigenous staff as well and um, increase their um, capacity, um, cultural capacity around knowing um, about Indigenous um, knowledge, um, Indigenous resources um, and um, how to um, support um, their um, fellow Indigenous um, members of staff to sort of deliver those services. Um, 
having an Indigenous librarian does not mean to say that you have um, fulfilled your, op um, your obligations. It's just the beginning. Um, like all staff members, they need support from others to help them do their job. The structure um, of the institutions need to review how um, policy and practice are carried out within the institutions themselves. Um, and in doing so, um, this may require some reorganisation. And when I say reorganisation, I mean looking at the, um, both the leadership and the governance within the institution itself, making sure that there's an Indigenous voice heard at the top table um, through representation on key um, policy making and decision making um, entities within, within the system. Um, and that includes at the governance level, level um, where there are um, opportunities there to engage again with local communities um, to have them represented within, within, the, uh, within the structure. Um, that you know, is, is uh, something that we have been doing in New Zealand and I, I think that you know, we, with some success, um, like even, everything, you know, there's um, room for improvement all the time. Um, and the last thing is to develop, and that is to develop relationships with those local communities. Um, I use the word engage there, and this is what happens when you um, change your mind about um, 20 minutes before you do the presentation. So it's to engage, not to develop. <laughs> um, I developed the slide to engage with you. Um, <laughs> So it's about engaging in those relationships with the, um, and becoming known in those communities, not only for the services and resources that you provide, but for being a, su a supporter of that community in the different um, areas that they need to, that um, your support in, and um, being part of that community um, so that they know that you are serious about having a relationship with them. In all, be strategic. Okay. Individuals. You need to do a lot of reflection about who you are, where you're from, what you know about yourself, and so know about your own culture. Because if, you, if you're not safe and secure in your own culture, it's very hard to accept somebody else's culture or worldview. Um, once you sort of um, uh, have located yourself, um, you will have more confidence about yourself and you'll be more open to um, accepting that other people see things from a different perspective. That's the theory. We know that in practice you may have to work much harder with some people than with others. Um, and in, do, in being more open to those um, alternative um, worldviews to your own, it's about learning about the values that are important in that worldview. Um, and so how they uh, contribute to the um, knowledge that it forms that worldview, and how those values um, are sort of uh, used when you are in the process of delivering services or resources. It's also about, um, as I said earlier, um, non-Indigenous staff giving Indigenous staff members that support that they require. Um, not every inquiry from an Indigenous person on the library will require a response from an Indigenous librarian. Because um, like uh, many um, people, they will have um, simple inquiries that have nothing to do with their indigeneity. They may want to you know, know something about finance or housing or you know, economics um, that um, you know, without an indigenous angle to it. So knowing how to engage, um, knowing, you know, your reference skills, using those, and don't just panic. It's an indigenous person, I need to get the indigenous librarian and find out that they just really needed to find out where the washrooms were. Um, 
So, you know, taking some of that pressure off, but knowing that you have the, um, the expertise in the building to help these people if they do need something um, much um, more um, um, important, oh, I suppose trying to find the washrooms can be quite important at times, but, but you, know, you, you understand what I'm saying. Um, but um, the other thing is to also participate in those professional um, education opportunities um, so that you don't um, lose momentum in your own um, journey of knowledge to finding out uh, how um, Indigenous um, culture of values, resources, services need to be um, developed. Um, and there is a common um, mistake that people go on a course and they think they know everything. Well, even our elders in our um, society sort of know that they don't know everything. Um, they will never claim to be an expert. They may say they have some expertise, um, but that is a way of saying that they are still open to new learning opportunities. And so um, as um, members of a library and information management profession, um, it's a lifelong journey of learning on a number of areas. Those of us that are a bit older can remember what it was like before um, computers came into the library and how we all had to make that adjustment. Um, and in some ways I haven't seen the same um, speed to learn more about culture by library and information management professionals um, as they were um, excited by the arrival of the latest um, computer or laptop in their library. So ne there needs to be some acknowledgement there. Organisations. Now, uh, here I'm talking mainly about professional associations. Again, like institutions, there's a need to review the structure of the um, professional organisation itself. How are Indigenous peoples represented within that structure? Um, what opportunities are there for um, input and engagement with those communities? What do the policies, um, codes of practice um, and other sort of committee structures look like? Where can First Nations, Inuit or Métis professionals make a contribution um, th through representation on those committees or in leadership positions? What opportunities are there for engagement in a partnership between the First Nations, Inuit and Métis um, professionals and the wider um, professional associations that um, exist. Also looking at the um, conferences and other events that um, these professional associations run on an annual basis. Looking at how Indigenous content can be incorporated, having Indigenous keynote speakers, um, engaging in relationships with the local people of um, where the conferences are being held. Um, and assisting um, First Nations, Inuit and Métis um, librarians to join together provincially and nationally in um, a, a professional associations that is, are going to give them that um, support culturally. Um, I know that Canada is a large country, um, but you know there is a structure. There is a Canadian Library Association. Um, there are provincial library associations and interest groups that they should all be working together to see how um, it can, um, how Indigenous librarians can be encouraged to um, engage with each other. Um, and then also um, those professional associations taking an interest in Indigenous issues. Um, so the, the largest um, issue on the table at the moment is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, about the residential schools. There were calls for action um, within the TRC report um, that focused very much on Libraries and Archives Canada. But probably those questions 
have um, some currency for other um, institutions as well to have a look at their own practices. Okay, so um, some issues for the profession generally. Um, as I said earlier, there uh, needs to be m more focus on recruitment, the development of specialist positions um, for uh, Indigenous um, staff members to sort of um, provide the support and services and for um, develop the resources for um, the um, Indigenous services. Um, but to not only um, look at uh, those areas in relation to Indigenous um, services, but also to think about the career progression of those Indigenous librarians or archivists. Um, thinking about how they can go on and um, go into other positions within, within the profession and not be um, pigeonholed in, um, in the Indigenous services um, position. So I think it's really important to see what other opportunities there are for Indigenous peoples across the, across the institutions that people were part of. Um, I mentioned earlier about the library and archival information education in the First Nations curriculum concentration here. Um, as I said, it's an excellent initiative. Um, and UBC needs to be congratulated for having that program in place for such a long time. We're not really seeing it from the other um, library and information management um, schools here in Canada, and there's a lot of scope there for them. Fortunately, UBC is out in front, and um, they've got some way to catch up, so hopefully you know, we can retain the competitive edge. Um, looking at how... Um, Professional development also works for First Nations and Inuit and Métis staff, looking not only at their professional development but cultural development as well. Because, as I said, you know, just because they are um, sort of Indigenous doesn't mean to say they know everything about being Indigenous. Um, we all need to continue growing, um, regardless of what culture we're from. Um, also looking at how um, the library or archival um, institution promotes itself, um, how it um, represents um, indigenous um, indigeneity in its publications, on its website, social media, um, that you know sort of sends a very clear message out to people about um, how serious you are about engaging with them. If they do not see themselves represented in those things, they think that there is no place for them in, in a library or archive. Um, I've talked a lot about relationship building, but that you can never do enough of that. Um, you know, it's about having that continuous presence and um, from that developing partnerships or many memorandums of understanding if you want to go um, down that route and hopefully from that getting their um, involvement in governance. So, concluding comments. To indigenise or to decolonise? I think you can do both. Um, obviously the decolonisation process is um, politi politically um, loaded but it is a decision for Indigenous peoples to make. If they want to decolonise, they want to set up their own cultural um, knowledge centres, then that's a decision that they need to make. Um, at the same time, I think you can do, uh, as I said, I think you can do both. They can um, repatriate some material to give it the protection and control that it requires. That may be digital repatriation, it may be repatriation of the original source and the, and the um, library or archive keeps the original. Um, obviously with archives there will be some um, legal um, issues there, so those would need to be worked through. Um, the decolonisation process will allow them some form of self-determination over the control of their knowledge. 
Um, and at the same time, um, indigenisation requires um, the library to sort of enter into those um, into um, negotiation with the indigenous communities. I think one of the advantages of indigenisation is that um, it means that indigenous stories will continue to be told within a library or an archive. Um, and so that um, as more indigenous stories are told in whatever form they might be, uh, whether it's a book, a journal, or um, through digital media, um, it will be their representative um, of uh, indigenous voices. Uh, given that there are plenty of non-indigenous voices that have um, published on indigenous issues over the years, and this is sort of a chance for um, indigenous information to still be there so that um, people can be talking to each other. Um, the decolonisation process in terms of um, developing a cultural centre also requires some assistance from a library or an archive um, or an expert in those areas to um, help um, those indigenous um, tribes uh, to develop their centres, they need the um, infrastructure and the um, facilities to ensure that that information or knowledge is going to be collected and preserved for future generations of that tribe, uh, of that um, particular community. So um, I don't know whether I've answered the question in any um, fullness. Um, as I said, this is a work in progress. Um, and certainly it's um, something that I've had an opportunity to think about in greater detail while I've been here and I've, it's something that I intend working on further when I return to New Zealand. Um, so thank you again for um, coming today and t for listening and um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions after I've given Kim a chance to say something in response. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody, and thank you so much, Spencer. Um, I don't really feel I have enough opportunity to really think about these deep questions, and they're really so important to what we do and what we're trying to do. And I think one of the most valuable things for me for this event and for what Spencer's brought to us is really the opportunity to um, make some really key ideas visible and to give us to give many people a chance to think about what these words and these concepts mean to us. Because I think the, the idea that relationship building is at the core really is so important. Um, it's one of the four R's um, from one of a key paper um, on Aboriginal education from Kirkness and Barnhart that has been really important to many, many Aboriginal scholars here at UBC, and um, it's a really key Aboriginal concept, and it's important in many aspects of Western scholarship in our profession as well, but it's, it's very visible. It's um, voiced very often in many Aboriginal contexts and disciplines. So I think that in terms of decolonizing and indigenizing, I think collectively we need to do both. And I think that all of these questions give us lots of ground to work with and to move along. Um, I think in there are so many similarities between New Zealand and Canada and UBC has been fortunate to have Linda Tuhue Smith and Graham Smith here, and they've given guidance to a number of UBC scholars and made connections to Aboriginal communities here in BC and in Canada that we're very grateful for. And I think that um, these connections also um, mean that we're not starting from scratch. We have lots of synergies and lots of intersections to work from. These are already amongst the Aboriginal community here in BC, they're shared ideas and they're shared concepts. 
And to my way of thinking, one of the ways that we take Spencer's ideas and that we can move forward from here where we are is look at shared understandings of our ethics, of how knowledge is created and how we take care of it and how we nurture it and strengthen it and nurture and strengthen communities along with it. And I think that having um, sponsorship and support from the Diversity Caucus is really important um, for this event as well because um, there's lessons here about how we're stronger together that play across many intersections, many other ways of um, of creating knowledge, of sharing knowledge, and pulling on archival traditions of um, authenticity and validity. Um, how do we trust knowledge? What's trustworthy and what's trusted, what we rely on, is so different from the many different communities and perspectives and academic disciplines that come together at the university. And I think one of the, um, Spencer's talked to us about the FNIM, the, the models that they've been working with professional development. So a structure for learning for information professionals in New Zealand. I think those give us lots of touchstones to move on the, the questions and the challenges that the information professionals face in Canada. Um, both from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, and the TRC recommendations, and the Legacy of Hope, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, all of those very big things, all of those very big initiatives, those big bodies of knowledge, and those big traditions of interaction um, give us many bridges and many points of contact and many, many different approaches. The healing tradition approaches for creating knowledge and giving us strength, they're all very much based on what we know and what we trust and strengthening identity and strengthening connections and strengthening relationships. And, I th and I'm disappointed that there weren't specific calls to action for libraries and information professionals in the TRC, but I'm not surprised because our structure and our work in many ways is, is very invisible. And I think that these kind of conversations gives us as a community of information professionals a chance to make our structures, to make our work and to make our value more visible. And in doing that, it makes the frictions between Western and our profession's way of knowing and other ways of knowing, particularly indigenous ways of knowing are more visible for me, but all other ways of knowing, it makes those frictions more visible. And I think that's a good thing because that gives us an opportunity to transform in a positive way, to transform in a way that makes us more relevant to other places and to other people. And I think that all of the points that Spencer talked about are all opportunities for us to see ourselves more deeply, to see myself as an Indigenous person in the context of a Western institution, and to see myself as an information profession in the context of a very complex, intercultural, interdisciplinary, transformative time. So. Um, one of the things also that was really important for me was the way that Spencer said, we need to really understand where knowledge comes from, where the knowledge that's in our care in particular, those of us have, who have collections to, that we're responsible for, or collections that we're looking to connect to the community. Because if we don't understand where they came from, we have a much more difficult job taking care of them respectfully and effectively. And those problems get multiplied outwards as we're teaching people from places of ignorance rather than places of knowledge and strength. And we need, um, there are many opportunities for indigenous people to learn Western ways. It's impossible to ignore them. And it's much more challenging for non-indigenous people to learn what's important for indigenous communities or important for indigenous knowledge. But if we don't have that two-way approach to learning, then we have 
points of connection and points where we're trying to connect where the non-indigenous people are coming from a place of ignorance and that leads us to encounters that are leads us to decisions and actions that are based on ignorance and that are based on politics rather than are based on relationships and understanding so i think that um we have many wonderful messy conversations yet to come and the mess isn't a problem in my mind it may be uncomfortable but it, it's necessary for where we're going so thank you very much so I'm just going to um, pass the mic over to Vanessa Cam, chair of the diversity and inclusion team and she's going to uh, offer the mic up for any questions for Spencer and or Kim Okay, great. So great to see everybody here. Um, as chair of the diversity and inclusion team, I'm so happy to have this opportunity to collaborate with the iSchool in bringing Spencer um, to speak. So um, are there any questions? Yes. Um, I'm just kind of wondering about uh, one of the first challenges, for example, that we here on the West Coast uh, and in BC would have to face, which is the fact that we have a very diverse indigenous makeup of the province and even of the local area here of many different voices, many different nations, etc. So I was wondering, you know, the connotation of how maybe to create a start on negotiating um, a way of dealing with so many different possible Aboriginal and Indigenous voices. Uh, when we're dealing with essentially one key center, the institution of the library, if I can, you know, call it that as a broad spectrum. Yes, um, I, I acknowledge that that is um, an issue that uh, would be a challenge. I guess the first answer is not to impose any structure on them. Um, it's about having a discussion with each of those communities and indicating that you are talking to the other communities and hopefully let them come together to work out how they are, they are going to engage. Um, it may be that you have to engage with each community separately, but um, then again they may agree that they're, they Age as a group, it's a, but it's m most important that you don't, you know, sort of restrict the way in which they can engage. Because if you do do that, you, you've probably lost. Um, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. Thank you. Hi Spencer. Well, <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there's like anything in particular that you'll bring back to New Zealand, like any initiatives or, or trends here in Canada, and then vice versa. Anything that you think we could learn? I think um, the main thing I will take back is um, understanding. Um, in New Zealand, you know, things are some always a bit. Um, tricky, but I can see that things are even trickier here. I think in New Zealand we're very lucky in that the Māori can come together and operate um, together, um, but, it, but when they choose to um, operate by themselves it, it, it's normally a much more clear-cut process than it is here. So I think what I've really, and one of the benefits of coming and looking at these things um, as an outsider but with an Indigenous lens is seeing that you know there is no one model for Indigeneity and every place needs to come to terms with what Indigeneity means in the context in which they find themselves. And um, 
that I think um, sort of shows that you know sort of perhaps we take things for granted too much in New Zealand because it, it does seem to be a bit easier for us and um, perhaps we, we need to push a bit harder and um, yeah sorry so uh, I think um, yeah the, the Canadian experience is um, sort of given me that, that broader perspective of indigeneity and I'll be following what happens with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission sort of findings um, with great interest to see how that flows through. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Richard. So I would like to know if um um, w what are the cases or examples that you know are the most exemplary to comment, for example, on the decolonialization, which I think is very interesting in terms of um, our perspectives, um, shaping or creating their own information organizations? Um, are you guys aware of some exemplar that we can say, you know, this, these are communities that are creating their own information organizations with their own perspectives and actually challenging the discipline um, to catch up or understand, for example, different ways of managing information? I can um, only really speak from the New Zealand perspective there. Um, and there are um, tribal organizations that are developing their own cultural centres where they are um, in major sort of negotiations with the different institutions over the repatriation of um, sort of um, knowledge sources from those places, some of which they want originals back, some of which they are prepared to take um, sort of uh, digital re um, copies. I think um, there is um, recognition by a number of institutions in New Zealand that they do have to engage more um, critically with the indigenous communities on their terms. Um, and we have seen you know, the inclusion of governance structures um, that sort of have allowed those um, negotiations to take place at a high level. Um, New Zealand's been going through its own form of truth and reconciliation for the last 40 years since the Waitangi Tribunal was formed in 1975 to um, look at breaches of um, the Treaty of Waitangi by the um, Crown or by the government and um, as part of that um, uh, uh, when tribes settled there is normally a um, cultural redress provision in there which looks at issues like um, I've been discussing today about how the um, tribe can um, recover some of those cultural um, sort of uh, objects that, um, that are meaningful to them and how the, they can restore their mana over, over those. And um, so there's some institutions that are working very closely with the iwi. Other, um, institutions are sort of um, negotiating with them over the, the, the care and protection of those resources. So it's, it's, it's a work in progress. It's, it's really hard to describe. Um, there are some tribes down the east coast of, the New, Zeal of New Zealand and in the South Island of New Zealand that have um, put major investments into developing their own cultural centres and um, they realise that they need to continue engaging with the um, typical um, library or museum or research library that they've, they've um, had to develop relationships with in the past. So even in the process of decolonisation there is still that ongoing discussion between local people and um, institutions. Yes. Louis. Mm. Uh, thanks, thanks, Spencer and, and Kim as well. Um, I'm wondering, and I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot here, but I'm wondering if there are specific recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that you feel is an opportunity for 
libraries and archives um, or professionals in our field to act on. Uh, or maybe others in the room have, have thoughts on where, where we should be starting there. I think that's a question for Kim. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, really a lot of wonderful discussions that are starting um, based on the TRC recommendations. And the one that comes to mind for me is the, um, the reference back to the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And um, a little before that, the report called Turning the Page from the Canadian Museums Association and the um, Assembly of First Nations. So there was a lot of um, points there to connect on um, developing opportunities within the museum profession and within the museum world for um, working jointly on cultural heritage areas. And I think those connect with the UN Declaration. Um, and I think that all of the educational provisions, I think libraries um, can look at so many of the things in the TRC that are talking about what they want people to know and to understand as something for us to consider in our instructional role and areas to develop in our collection. And so many of the recommendations in the TRC are rooted in work that Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal individuals and institutions have been doing for decades and decades and decades. And we can help to surface connections between work that's been done and work that the TRC wants us to move on. And I think that for a lot of people, that information is hard to find. And we're well positioned to, to help them with that. So I think we're about out of time. Um, so I would like to thank everybody, particularly Spencer, uh, for a really engaging lecture, and Kim for her response. Um, thank, thank you, everybody, and hope to see you again soon. One person, uh, well, two people I forgot to thank. Uh, the two people that we have represented in this photo on the wall, um, Suzanne Cates Dodson and Earl Dodson, who, um, whose bequest um, uh, you know, sort of has made the Dodson um, professor's position possible, uh, plus everything else they contributed to UBC. Um, it was a real honour to be able to give this um, presentation today in this room um, and hopefully you know even if it's only through the presence of their photo here that you know that the, they can see that good work is being done in their name so thank you <laughs>